Jacob had struggled his whole life for blessing. But today, in his greatest struggle yet, he finally prevails. Or does he? You're listening to The Bible Brief. Sometimes we get the idea that God's plans can be thwarted. We think that if we make a misstep or get on God's wrong side in some way, that His plans for us may fail or fall through. But when we think in this way, we think of God in too small of terms. While we humans certainly have free will, we can forget that God has free will too, and He's better at it than we are. He not only has free will to do whatever He wants, but He uses it with perfect righteousness. God can use even our worst decisions, our worst moments, and use them to achieve His good plans and ends. He's not limited to using only righteous people or the best among us. He uses our good moments and our bad moments to accomplish His purposes in each of our lives. Our unrighteousness, though not His desired behavior for us, can't thwart God's righteous plans. Jacob is a great example of this phenomenon, where God uses the free will of a man, both good and bad, to accomplish his plan. God's plan was expressed when Jacob and Esau were still in the womb of their mother. And in that plan, God chose the younger of the two brothers. He had said the older will serve the younger. As readers, knowing what God has said, it can be odd for us to read about the deal-making and deceit of Jacob. Many of his actions are morally questionable at best. After all, dressing up like your older brother to trick your blind father is hardly honest behavior. And yet God appears to be using even these actions to accomplish the plan which he had already expressed. He's not limited to using only perfect people. He can use every single person for his ultimate purposes. And this leads to a principle that we can remember as we think about God. God accomplishes His promises in and through the free choices of humans. And no free choice that we make can get in the way of God. As we continue to look at the life of Jacob, we discover this in real time through the struggles in his life. Through Jacob's deal-making with Esau, he gained the birthright. Through Jacob's deceit of Isaac, he gained the blessing of his father. Through an unhealthy competition between sisters, Jacob gained offspring. And as we'll see, through a wrestling match with God, Jacob will gain a blessing that had already been promised to him. But now Jacob is on his way back to Canaan, and he's thinking about the man who he's going to meet when he gets there. Rage. Rage is what Jacob remembered from the last time he saw his brother Esau. A rage that had been simmering since Jacob got the birthright from Esau, then went into a full boil when Jacob deceitfully stole the blessing. Esau had wanted to kill him. That, after all, was why he went to Haran in the first place. He was escaping the murderous rage of Esau. But now, on his journey back to the land, he was going to see his brother again. After over 20 years, seemingly a lifetime ago, Jacob will discover if that rage is still boiling. And Jacob fears that it is. Let's read what Jacob does as he approaches his homeland. Jacob sent messengers before him to Esau, his brother, in the land of Seir, the country of Edom, instructing them, Thus you shall say to my lord Esau, Thus says your servant Jacob, I have sojourned with Laban and stayed until now. I have oxen, donkeys, flocks, male servants, and female servants. I have sent to tell my Lord, in order that I may find favor in your sight. And the messengers returned to Jacob, saying, We came to your brother Esau, and he is coming to meet you, and there are four hundred men with him. Then Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed. He divided the people who were with him, and the flocks and the herds and the camels, into two camps, thinking, if Esau comes to one camp and attacks it, then the camp that is left will escape. Hearing that 400 men were coming to meet the caravan of Jacob inspires great fear in him, 
400 men was a bigger army than Abraham had when he defeated those kings many years prior. 400 men might decimate the house and wealth of Jacob. And so Jacob starts scheming to retain at least some of his property and family. And the first step is dividing his household into two camps. Spacing the two camps apart meant that if Esau destroyed one, Jacob could still retain the other. However, after this initial strategic step, Jacob prays, which is perhaps a clue as to Jacob's state of mind. Up to this point, we don't have any other significant proactive praying on Jacob's part. His interactions with God are largely responses to God instead of requests directed to God. Jacob is in distress, and his distress leads him to a humble prayer. He prays, O God of my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac, O Lord who said to me, Return to your country and to your kindred that I may do you good. I am not worthy of the least of all the deeds of steadfast love and all the faithfulness that you have shown to your servant. For with only my staff I crossed this Jordan, and now I have become two camps. Please deliver me from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him, that he may come and attack me, the mothers with the children. But you said, I will surely do you good, and make your offspring as the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered for multitude." In his prayer, Jacob appeals to God and God's promises as he pleads for protection from his brother. Jacob's fear has led him to a place of dependence upon God. Let's keep reading. So from what he had with him, he took a present for his brother Esau, 200 female goats and 20 male goats, 200 ewes and 20 rams, 30 milking camels and their calves, 40 cows, 10 bulls, 20 female donkeys, and ten male donkeys. These he handed over to his servants, every drove by itself, and said to his servants, Pass on ahead of me and put a space between drove and drove. He instructed the first, When Esau my brother meets you and asks, To whom do you belong? Where are you going? And whose are these ahead of you? Then you shall say, They belong to your servant Jacob. They are a present sent to my lord Esau. And moreover, he is behind us. He likewise instructed the second and the third and all who followed the droves. You shall say the same thing to Esau when you find him, and you shall say, Moreover, your servant Jacob is behind us. For he thought, I may appease him with the present that goes ahead of me, and afterward I shall see his face. Perhaps he will accept me. Jacob decides to send substantial gifts to Esau via his servants, as a way to perhaps appease the anger of Esau and cool down his brother's emotions. Maybe with enough gifts, his brother will call off the 400 men headed their way. At least Jacob can hope. Next, he even separates himself from his family as he sends them away across a stream. It says, That same night he arose and took his two wives, his two female servants and his eleven children, and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. He took them and set them across the stream and everything else he had. And Jacob was left alone. We don't know exactly why Jacob has done this. Perhaps he was embarrassed at the great fear that was overwhelming him. Perhaps he wanted to be alone for what might be his last night alive. But if solitude was his goal, he found anything but. His night alone becomes a wrestling match that echoes through the remaining pages of the Bible. A wrestling match where Jacob ends up injured, but with a new name. Let's read this fascinating account. And a man wrestled with Jacob until the break of the day. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched Jacob's hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then the man said, Let me go, for the day has broken. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And he said to him, What is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then the man said, Your name shall no longer be Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with men, and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, Please tell me your name. But he said, Why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, saying, For I have seen God face to face, and yet my life has been delivered. The sun rose upon him as he passed Penuel, limping because of his hip. 
Now, if you are a little confused, you're not alone. This account of the wrestling match at the River Jabbok has been of great interest to Bible readers since it was written down. A man wrestles with Jacob, appears to be losing, until the man merely touches Jacob's hip to put it out of joint. Jacob is then bound to lose, yet won't let go of the man until the man blesses him. The man blesses Jacob and then grants him a new name, but doesn't respond when Jacob asks for the name of the man. Finally, Jacob identifies the man as God. He names the wrestling venue, Peniel, saying, I have seen God face to face, and yet my life has been delivered. We need to make a couple of observations here before we can think about what this story communicates to us. First, clearly the man is not merely a man. He has the power to merely touch Jacob to injure him. He speaks with naming authority. He blesses out of superiority. And Jacob identifies the man as God. Next, Jacob prevailing over the man is accomplished before the power of the man is revealed in his injuring touch. By the end of the scene, Jacob himself understands that his life was spared by the man. There's no sense of gloating for having initially prevailed. And finally, Jacob ends up with a new name, a name that we find on page after page through the rest of the Bible. The name Israel. The new name of Jacob that would become the name of the nation that would come from him. Israel. Now this name change becomes the significant marker of the meaning of the story. Because the name means something. Up to this point in his life, Jacob had struggled. He'd struggled and deceived and schemed for almost everything that he now had. And on the precipice of meeting Esau, he was considering losing everything he'd struggled for. Yet in this scene, Jacob struggles again, even after the hip injury caused by the man, struggling for blessing from God himself. And this man says to Jacob, You have striven with God and with man and have prevailed before giving him the name Israel. Oddly enough, Israel itself has an ambiguous meaning. It can mean, strives with God, but it can also mean, God strives. It's as if with this name change, God is saying to Jacob, in your struggles for blessing, you've prevailed, but God has struggled with you. In this moment, God gives Jacob a view into the window of his life. God shows Jacob that Jacob wasn't struggling alone, but God had been there alongside, continuing his plan for blessing. Not just blessing Jacob, but blessing the whole world through the seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But soon, the sun comes up, and Jacob sees his brother Esau on the horizon along with 400 able-bodied men. The time had come. Jacob lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, Esau was coming, and 400 men with him. So he divided the children among Leah and Rachel, and the two female servants, and he put the servants with their children in the front, then Leah with her children, and Rachel and Joseph last of all. He himself went on before them, bowing himself to the ground seven times, until he came near to his brother. But Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him, and they wept. Jacob, it turns out, had nothing to fear from Esau. You see, for the last 20 years, God wasn't merely working out a plan with Jacob. He was also working his plan with Esau. Over those 20 years, God had blessed Esau with possessions and flocks of his own, so much so that Esau's jealousy and rage slowly subsided until that day many years later when he reunites with his brother again. God did what Jacob couldn't because God was working out a plan. Alongside Jacob's struggling and striving and scheming was God, seeing and working all things according to his plan, a plan for blessing.
Join us next time as we see trouble brewing among the sons of Jacob. Trouble that begins with the violation of a sister, continues with the slaughter of a village, and ends with selling Jacob's favorite son into slavery. The Bible Brief is brought to you by the Bible Literacy Foundation, dedicated to helping people like you learn the Bible.